the next talk is from Charles Swanson. Um, Charles actually did his MD and PhD training at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in the UK. Um, he completed his co clinician scientist and medical oncology changing, training at the Cancer Research UK. Um, and he's been elected as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. Um, after several years as a group leader in the London Research Institute, in 2011, he made chair of the personalized cancer medicine and consultant of thoracic me medical oncology at UCL hospitals. And he heads the Cancer Research UK Lung Cancer Evolutionary Study and also the Cancer Research UK and UCL uh, Lung uh, Cancer Center of Excellence. And he also conducts both clinical duties and research in the mechanisms of drug resistance. The title of his talk is Spatial and Temporal Dynamics of Tumor Evolution and Implications for Drug Development. Please welcome Charles. Well, thank you very much to Tyler and Mike for inviting me to this fantastic symposium. And I must say also thank you to the last two speakers for two such excellent talks that will help me get through in 25 minutes. Right, so um, the background um, to the lo a lot of the work that I do, if I can just get this pointed to work, is that um, many of the drugs we use in medical oncology, particularly in thoracic oncology, are coming at increasing cost, um, and um, there's a relative mismatch between cost and benefit. Um, so if you look at the last um, 71 anti-cancer drugs approved by the FDA, um, the median of improvement in overall survival um, associated with those 71 anti-cancer drugs was only 2.1 months. And the cost of care now is put at about $10,000 per month. Um, and recently, Len Saltz from uh, MSK estimated that for pembrolizumab, the cost for a one-year treatment in melanoma is over a million US dollars. And we can't afford this in Europe. We certainly can't afford this in the United Kingdom. So we need new approaches. We need, really need to understand why uh, cancer is the emperor of all maladies and why, indeed, um, drug resistance is inevitable um, for, for at least targeted therapies and uh, cytotoxics in the majority of advanced solid tumors. And so um, we're very interested in um, understanding the impact of tumor heterogeneity on drug response. I'm sorry, this uh, advance is not working. Um, so um, the heterogeneity can be thought of in three ways. Heterogeneity between patients with the same histological subtype. Heterogeneity that's regional, uh, separated within individual biopsies, as you've just heard. And heterogeneity down to the single cell level, which I'm sure you'll hear more about this afternoon, where cells in the same tumor differ by um, focal or large-scale genomic aberrations. And I think each one of these aspects is likely to uh, uh, impact on achieving cures in metastatic disease and the cost of cancer drug development uh, and success and failure in general. So um, in collaboration with um, Andy Futrill and colleagues at the Sanger, um, we've been um, uh, looking um, at uh, cancer evolution in the context of clear cell renal carcinoma, really with the emphasis on trying to identify biomarkers of response initially to uh, anti-angiogenesis therapies. Um, we've systematically failed to achieve that goal, um, but what we've um, really been exploring since uh, our failure to identify biomarkers in response to Avastin and other therapies such as that is really trying to understand how clear cell carcinoma of the kidney evolves and what are the mechanisms governing its evolution. And what we've concluded from the first 10 or so patients we've, we've looked at in detail is that driver events can be subclonal, as you all know, but missed through a single biopsy. So each patient has a distinct and unique set of uh, clonal and subclonal driver events that I think are going to make uh, thinking about targeted therapies um, for patients across broad cohorts in this disease quite complex, simply because each patient has a unique uh, 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 contribution of subclonal driver events to their disease, and targeting each one may prove um, very difficult, particularly when many of these are tumor suppressor genes. So when thinking about this in the context of medical oncology, we're interested in understanding how diversity within tumors uh, results in drug resistance. Um, and in the context of one of the first patients we looked at, in the context of a neoadjuvant study of Everolimus, so these patients were treated with six weeks of this mTOR inhibitor. Prior to surgery, we were able to then look at the impact of Everolimus on um, the downstream components of the mTOR pathway using antibodies of phospho, 4-EBP, and S6 kinase. Um, and in this first patient that we looked at, um, we could see evidence where um, parts of the, uh, the primary tumor had um, residual mTOR activity, say region 5 as shown here, um, where um, 
you could see evidence of um, the mTOR pathway being active in terms of phosphor S6 and phosphor 4 EBP. And other reasons are the primary and the metastasis where the um, mTOR pathway had been sufficiently attenuated. And when uh, Marco Gerlinger in my lab then looked at the phylogenetic tree of this tumor, he found there was an mTOR mutation that overlied with the regions where the mTOR pathway was switched on, uh, and a leucine to proline mutation of the amino acid 2,431. Um, and then when we reconstituted that particular leucine proline mutation in vitro in a cell line with wild-type mTOR and deprived that cell line from, of serum, we could still see residual activity of the mTOR pathway in terms of phospho S6 um, activity. And then Neil MacDonald, a structural biologist at the uh, Cancer Research UK London Research Institute, as it, as it was then, um, found that this particular leucine proline residue was um, abutting the activation loop of the kinase in a repressor domain, and the hypothesis was that potentially this was leading to constitutive activation of the kinase. I think what this begins to show us is that the heterogeneity of a subclonal event in the context of mTOR could lead to a heterogeneous response to mTOR inhibitor therapy. So what are, the, what are the potential opportunities with my medical oncology hat on for developing trials in the context of these heterogeneous tumors? And I mean, the first obvious point is, um, can we define uh, truncal drivers more readily um, and target them quickly? Um, so these truncal drivers in the, in the trunks or the roots of the phylogenetic trees that are present in early ancestors in, the, in, in, in all uh, tumor cells, um, and one might hope that by targeting them, one might, one might be able to eradicate or at least control the disease as efficiently as possible. But we're also interested in understanding the subclonal events, the branches, and understanding how those branches are pruned during therapy and how, they might be, how some branches might be selected for during the acquisition of resistance to therapy. So in the context of renal carcinoma, it's actually quite simple. What are the truncal drivers? It's really just VHL, um, uh, VHL 5' prime um, deletion, and 3P loss of heterozygosity on, upon which VHL is encoded. So these are the two early events in renal carcinoma evolution. But the problem is, is subclonal drivers we think are going to confound treatment success. Um, and in many cases, in fact, eight of the 10 cases, we find evidence for more subclonal drivers that are spatially separated than are present in every biopsy. And so this confounds um, our ability to find them, obviously, because I've been some biopsies but not others. But they, they appear to, uh, in the, at least in the context of clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, um, outnumber the number of uh, clonally dominant trunk events. And so when trying to then estimate uh, the number of driver events that are present in a single tumor in re renal cell carcinoma, this makes life quite tricky. So if you take a, a single biopsy um, uh, and, and you estimate, say, the frequency of P3 mutations across a large number of patients, context of TCGA, 164 patients, it's estimated that P3 mutations occur in about 5% of, of biopsies. Um, and then if you take a per-patient basis where we look at, say, somewhere between 4 and 10 biopsies per patient, we can find evidence of P53 mutations in about 40% of cases. So a single biopsy, at least in the context of renal cell carcinoma, underestimates the number of driver events that, that, are, that are active in this disease or present in this disease. So how can we then identify these trunk driver events? If I'm saying to you that, well, in the context of, let's say, early phase trials, we can identify these trunk driver events, we could then target them more effectively. So can we use NGS approaches to, to identify what those trunk events are? And at least in, in renal cancer, and we see the same thing in non-small cell lung cancer as well, actually, it can be quite difficult because you get this illusion of clonal dominance within a single biopsy. So this is shown here. If you take regions 8, 2, and 4, um, and you look at those driver events on the x-axis, VHL, P10, PBRM1, and ATM, um, they all have quite similar clonal variant allele, variant allele frequencies, somewhere between 40 and 50%. So particularly, PBRM1 and VHL have almost identical variant allele frequencies. So even when you account for tumor purity and local copy number um, changes, it can be quite difficult to really determine whether an individual driver is clonally dominant. Simply put here, you can see that in regions 10 in the venous thrombus and region 3 um, towards the back of the slide, those yellow mutations, those uh, yellow driver mutations, are entirely absent from those biopsies. So they, they, they are, in fact, subclonal events that have presumably uh, initiated or contributed towards a selective sweep within that region in regions 8, 10, and um, re in regions 8, 2, and 4 that give this illusion of clonal dominance. So it can be quite difficult to determine a priori what is actually clonally dominant and what's not to, if we had targeted therapies against these, these events, which we don't do, to, to uh, then uh, target them effectively. 
So when we were first discussing these results with Andy Futrell uh, at the Sanger, um, one of the first questions he asked us was, how deep is the rabbit hole? And I wasn't exactly sure what he meant by that, but on, on further discussion, what he was getting at here is really how many driver events are present in, every, in, in, in any individual tumour. And like many of Andy's questions, very simply put, but very difficult to answer. Um, and we've been sort of trying to get to grips with this over the last 18 months or so, and I'm sure we've got another two or three years to go before we have an answer to this. Um, but essentially, if you plot the number of biopsies against the number of driver events, both somatic copy number aberrations as well as uh, somatic mutational drivers, you can see that in some tumours, the one on the left, EVO005, we've not saturated the tumour at seven biopsies. We've got 12 driver events, but the, 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 the line is not plateauing in contrast to RM8004, where um, we're beginning to see a plateau around about between 15 and 20 drivers. So Samra uh, Turalik in my lab is currently using a, a driver gene panel, which the beauty about renal carcinoma is actually the genetics are pretty well described now, about 105 drivers uh, plus uh, about 30 or so um, recurrent copy number events, which we can fit quite easily into a capture panel. Um, and now sequence multiple biopsies much, much more cheaply than exome sequencing. Obviously, it makes downstream analysis more straightforward as well. And we can start to answer some questions about the relatedness of subclones within a, within a large primary tumor. Um, and um, what, what she, she's already found is that, that you can have um, quite related subclones that are very spatially separate. So if you just look at this, um, this morphological picture here of a tumor, the brown clones are related much closely, more closely related subclones, and they can be separated by seven or eight centimeters in this tumor. Now, we don't yet know in 3D whether, these, whether there's direct communication in, let's say, a U shape in this tumor, but it's beginning to sort of show some quite interesting patterns of clonal intermixing and, and subclonal relatedness that differ um, by uh, several centimeters across the primary tumor. And as well as um, begin to show actually these trees become incredibly ornate the deeper we look. So um, this is one of the first cases we've looked at um, in not very many biopsies, only about 12 or so biopsies. We find evidence of 20 driver events in this particular patient in terms of uh, copy number events as well as um, uh, somatic mutational drivers in the lymph node metastasis as well as the primary. And then when we look at this one in, in trying to remodel this in 3D, again, we can see evidence of uh, the lymph node metastasis deriving from um, a subclone, this purple subclone in the tumor that appears to be in two different sites separated by seven or eight centimeters. So we're really trying to understand what might be the processes resulting in spread of these subclones within a tumor. Are they, is it hematogenous spread? I mean, what exactly is the reason for this and does it matter? And again, these trees, uh, as, we, as we can sequence more biopsies, become more, more ornate. And I'm hoping will start to give us some insights into the mechanisms within one primary tumor that foster metastasis and perhaps more dead ends um, over to the left-hand side in these subclones here that don't seem to have contributed to the lymph node metastasis at all. I mean, obviously, the salient point here is the lots of copy number changes that you can see associated with region 59 and the subsequent lymph node metastasis that you're not seeing on the other branches of the tumor phylogenetic tree. And we're very interested in these macroevolutionary events, which I'll talk about in a minute or two. So towards um, sort of developing, a, 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 I guess, a, a, an evolutionary rule book, we're very interested in trying to exploit some of the constraints to tumor evolution, thinking about tumors like chess in 3D, can we start to predict the next evolutionary move several, several moves in advance? Because much of what we do in clinical practice is sort of proactive, uh, sorry, reactively um, uh, managing a tumor when it presents to, represents to us in clinic with progressive disease. Could we forestall that next evolutionary move by guessing what, what it'll do next and perhaps stopping it from doing so with, with by implementing a particular drug that prevents a tumor going down that next evolutionary route? And, and, and because of the sort of simplicity of renal cancer genetics, we're, we're beginning to gain greater insights there, I think, than we are in lung cancer, which is far more complicated. Um, but we're seeing evidence of parallel evolution of subclones in multiple different regions of the primary tumor with recurrent genetic events affecting the same tumor suppressor gene in the context of SETD2 or KDM5C, different uh, somatic mutations resulting in loss of function events in different regions, bearing in mind SETD2 is encoded on 3P, the first event in tumor evolution, or one of the first events is 3P LOH, and then the second hit is, uh, in this case, a frame shift, a splice site, or a missense mutation that leads to an activation of SETD2. Similarly, we can see genetic heterogeneity can affect the same protein complex in different branches. Um, you've got different components of the SWI-SNF uh, chromatin remodeling complex being affected by somatic events in three different branches of the tumor. 
Um, we've recently published this um, uh, small uh, cohort of eight patients treated with neoadjuvant therapy um, in esophageal adenocarcinoma, where we saw in an adenocarcinoma, quite strikingly, multiple notch one um, um, aberrations occurring in three different branches of the tumor's evolutionary tree, so suggesting that really this, this is a pressure to select for notch one mutations following a P53 truncal mutation. And so what we're wondering in the lab is we if we understood more about the early events in tumor evolution, the tumor microenvironment and the germline of the patient, could we one day perhaps predict that this tumor, after making a TP3 mutation, had to then inactivate notch one through one mechanism or another, and perhaps initiate a therapy in due course that might exploit that dependency and stop the tumor from, from moving down that evolutionary route. And of course, you know, we're seeing in the literature from, from many workers in the field, the sort of page one or the preface of this evolutionary rule book revealing with some subclonal events that are always or often branched and some events that are always clonal um, in the trunks of the tumor's evolutionary trees. And I think this is beginning to sort of shed light on how we might more effectively target some of these tumor types. Um, and indeed, why we've been targeting some of these tumor types so well already, EGFR, activating mutations being an example, in non-small cell lung cancer that us and others, and Jeff Engelman particularly, have shown that, that really um, are hardwired in the tumor genome and are, are never or rarely lost during tumor progression. So one of the things I haven't mentioned particularly is this issue of cancer macroevolution that's largely ignored in drug development processes. And um, this has been elucidated by many in the field, chromosomal instability, both numerical and structural, chromoplexy, chromothripsis, and genome doubling events that can create very profound changes and phenotypic consequences on the tumor genome, presumably, due to these large-scale genomic rearrangements. Um, this paper was published in Nature um, last year, which I think really illustrates how chromosomal rearrangements might you know, be implicated in speciation. It's been a long and controversial field going back to the 60s and 70s, and Goldschmidt and colleagues who were largely ostracized from the evolutionary community for suggesting that speciation was driven by chromosomal rearrangements. And this, this paper, really looking at Gibbons, really showed very nicely, I think, that, that perhaps chromosomal rearrangements have had a major role in evolution of um, species in general. And, and what they found, and, and what's well known in the field, is that chimps, gorillas, and orangutans have 24 pairs of chromosomes, but gibbons have somewhere between 19 and 26 pairs of chromosomes and are karyotypically very diverse. Like um, many of us um, we, uh, in the audience, um, we, that these gibbons, they walk upright, they, they don't have a tail, they're monogamous, um, but they um, also, unlike us, swing at speeds of up to 55 kilometers an hour, and they have a ball and socket joint for a wrist rather than an eight-boned wrist that we have. And how you go from an eight-boned wrist to a ball and socket joint really baffled m many people in the field. And what this whole genome sequencing paper, the Gibbon genome, revealed is that there were these mobile DNA elements that had inserted about 27 or 30 times, 27 to 30 times, across the Gibbon genome, um, very close to genes involved in um, chromosome segregation, such as BubR1 and MAD1-like one. And they postulated that, the, and also these genes that, th through which these larva insertion elements had, had inserted close to, had accelerated evolution, suggesting they'd had to adapt to this insertional event very quickly, um, that had perhaps compromised genomic integrity, leading to this karyotypic diversity that we're now familiar with in the given, in the given genre. So I guess what I'm trying to say in a roundabout route is if, if karyotypic diversity can lead to such profound changes in species, or at least be associated with profound changes in species, what can they do to a cancer? Um, and you know, and ha what might be the impact of that in terms of uh, a drug development? Um, sorry, I'm struggling a little bit with this pointer. To, here we go. So, so we've looked at this in the context of renal cell carcinoma, and we took uh, 440 clear cell carcinomas from the Cancer Genome Atlas, 48 biopsies from eight clear cell renal carcinomas, and we overlaid those on the, uh, these 440 tumors from the TCGA and SNP-CGH analysis in hierarchical analysis, and asked if you take 48 biopsies from eight tumors, how similar are they? Do they, do they segregate with each other, or are they more separate? And what um, we found is that in um, five out of eight cases, they were more separate, so that, that um, in the sister biopsies from the same tumor, segregated more closely from other tumors in the cancer genome atlas than they did with themselves, suggesting that these, sort of, these, these changes in, in chromosomal complexity within an individual tumor could lead to quite, quite um, extreme diversity 
where sister biopsies could become more related to other tumors than, than their own ancestors. Um, and uh, so one consequence of, of, of this diversity that we see in renal cancer is sampling bias that I think is going to, uh, you know, will or has had an impact on our ability to validate cancer biomarkers. So when we apply a, a, an established and probably the best um, cancer biomarker, genomic biomarker in the context of renal cancer, it's an expression um, a signature that separates good from poor prognostic uh, groups of patients to 10 tumors for which we've applied multi-region uh, transcriptomic analysis, we find that in seven out of 10 cases, we find evidence of both good and poor prognostic signatures within the same tumor, illustrating heterogeneity within, uh, within this uh, prognostic uh, signature. So um, if I can just move on, just briefly to discuss this issue that I think it will also affect our ability to work out what might be the best drug for the right patient at the right time. is this issue that low frequency events at diagnosis might influence uh, clinical outcome. This is just an anecdotal case, a, a very tragic case I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. A 40-year-old lady who um, um, developed an astrocytoma with an adjacent grade 4 glioblastoma and was treated with standard therapy following surgery, adjuvant therapy with a stop regimen, radiotherapy and temozolomide. Tumor recurred four years later. Um, and the tumor, both the primary and the recurrent tumor, was subject to multi-region whole genome sequencing. And we endeavored to reconstruct the tumor phylogenetic tree. And what um, um, we found is that there was a truncal IDH1 mutation um, that was present in both the grade 2 primary and the grade 4 primary tumor, as well as a genome doubling event in the grade 4 primary tumor. But then at recurrence, that I truncal IDH1 mutation was barely detectable. Um, and instead, what we were seeing was this evolution of a double minute chromosome um, that was now dominating the disease at recurrence that was only just detectable in the grade 4 um, glioblastoma primary. And this double minute chromosome had evolved from the grade 4 primary to now dominate the disease at the recurrence, encoding multiple copies of PDGF receptor alpha C kit and a microRNA called MIR26A2 that degrades P10 messenger RNA presumably leading to multiple uh, mechanisms through which the PI3 kinase axis could be um, efficiently um, uh, um, increased in activity. So I think what this illustrates is this IDH1 mutation, this truncal event, can be lost at progression through a copy number of events, as we heard in the last talk. And then that, that's superseded by uh, the progressive evolution of this double minute chromosome that dominates the disease at recurrence that was really subclonal in the primary tumor. Um, so this has led to uh, a, a study in the United Kingdom called the Tracer X uh, Consortium, which stands for Tracking Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Through Evolution. We're, we're studying primary non-small cell lung cancers and examining their disease um, at diagnosis, multi-region analysis to establish phylogenetic trees on a patient-by-patient -patient basis in 842 patients, and then following those patients through adjuvant, uh, their adjuvant disease course. And for the patients who are unfortunate enough to suffer disease recurrence, we'll ask for permission for uh, and consent for a, a repeat biopsy to identify the origins of the lethal subclone. And we hope through uh, similar post-mortem studies, as you heard in the last talk, to really, in, in, in a very small minority of patients, to be able to follow the disease really from diagnosis through to death, to really understand a lot more about the clonal dynamics of these tumors over time and understand about the origins potentially of the lethal subclone and metastasis in non-small cell lung cancer more widely. And the primary endpoint of this study is to, to look at the relationship between clonal diversity and outcome. Are the more complex tumors, the phylogenetic trees with, uh, with more branches, such as this bow, bow tree associated with worse outcome than palm tree-like tumors? And in our sort of very early analysis of, of six or seven patients that we collaborated with Peter Campbell on at the, the Sanger, we found sort of, uh, as you might expect, differences in phylogenetic trees as we saw with renal cancer, very long trunks, um, consistent with these patients being uh, heavy smokers for many years, much longer than the trunks that you saw in renal cancer towards the right-hand side of this slide, but also um, differences in branch lengths um, that were comparable, if not larger, than the branch lengths we saw in renal cancer. And bear in mind, these are all primary tumors, unlike those renal cancers, many of which were stage four tumors. And so we're very interested in trying to exploit now the temporal order of events to try to highlight mechanisms of diversity and sort of, I think, very relevant to Mike's talk earlier, I would like to just quickly talk about Apobec in the last minute or so of the talk. And in this tumor really illustrates this point that these mutational processes 
occur at distinct time points in tumor evolution and not sort of uniform throughout evolution of the disease. In this case, it's an adenosquamous carcinoma with 10,000 private mutations specific to the adenocarcinoma uh, biopsy compared to the squamous biopsy, but they were related through common mutations in MLL3, LRP1b, uh, and other, other mutations. And so for the sake of the next couple of slides, we just focus on APABEC and the C2A tobacco mutations. And what Nikki McGranahan in the lab found is that in the trunk of this tumor's evolutionary tree, consistent with this patient being a heavy smoker, you see these C2A mutations um, at the bottom. And in region three, the squamous carcinoma, again, you see these C2A mutations consistent with this smoking environment this, this tumor had evolved through. But in region one of the tumor, you see the C to T and the C to G mutations, this apobec like signature occurring within a TC dinucleotide context, specifically in the adenocarcinoma biopsy, but not the squamous carcinoma biopsy. So was this just an anecdotal case, and did it matter? Well, and I think it does matter, because what Nikki found is that the driver events in region one of the tumor, the adenocarcinoma biopsy, um, occurred within an APABEC context, TGF-beta receptor 1 and PTPRD. So what we think is happening is APABEC is being switched on, late, for reasons we don't yet understand, later on in tumor evolution, that then drives a sort of substrate for diversity upon which selection can act, then selects out individual driver events that might have an APABEC-specific mutation, leading to subclonal expansion. And so Nikki then looked at the, the other next five tumors we had at the adenocarcinomas that we subjected to multi-region sequencing, and found that the C2A mutations are depleted in the branches um, at the expense of the um, APABEC mutations um, um, in the branches, which are now enriched. So it appears to be something more general occurring in these five patients. But what about um, looking at 2,500 patients in the context of the cancer genome atlas across nine tumor types, which Nikki's now done? He's now subjected to mutational signature analysis from the Stratton and Alexandros signatures to the clone, clonal mutations and the subclonal mutations in those 2,500 tumors. And what he's found is that in four cancer types, ER negative breast cancer, bladder carcinoma, um, head and neck squamous carcinoma, and lung adenocarcinoma, we see enrichment of the APABEC A rule in the subclones of these tumors. So that is presumably the branches of these tumor evolutionary trees, where APABEC is really a later evol evolutionary process that might be fostering subclonal evolution. And sort of, you know, in this anecdotal case, again, we're seeing in this primary metastasis transition um, enrichment of the APABEC mutational processes from region one to three of the primary through to the CNS metastasis with um, enrichment of the APABEC mutational signature compared to what we see in the trunk, which is a sort of familiar C2A uh, mutational signature being a sort of dominant event. And when you look at the driver events across these nine tumor types across 140 um, odd driver genes, we see that many of these driver mutations can be subclonal as well as clonal. If they were always clonal events, this table would always be white, every box would be white, but instead we see some of these mutations occurring in driver genes being subclonal, and for four tumor types at least, we're finding evidence of the APABEC mutational process being enriched in those subclones and in those subclonal mutations specifically. So, and, and this is the last couple of slides really just to show that particular pathways are not created equal and that some signal transduction pathways are more commonly truncal events or mutations in those pathways are more commonly truncal events than others. The RAS-MEC pathway, for instance, more commonly truncal. Um, mutations in those pathways are more commonly truncal than mutations in the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, which are more often branched than, than, than the RAS-MEC pathway. Um, in the interest of time, I think I've, I'm overrunning. I'll just quickly finish by saying that cytotoxic therapy itself is mutagenic. Um, we're finding in the context of platinum therapy, these C2A mutations that can occur in esophageal adenocarcinoma following um, 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 platinum therapy um, occurring in resistant disease. Um, and we're setting up clinical trials now that aiming, are aiming to exploit uh, the heterogeneity of driver events and ask very simple questions about whether the clonal dominance of a driver event really matters in terms of targeted therapy response. And we, through TracerX, trying to understand the drivers of branch evolution, of which we think there are many yet undiscovered processes, including APABEC, chemotherapy itself, genome doubling events, and particular genome instability processes <coughs> that we hope to sort of look into in more detail in the context of TracerX. So I'll just summarize by saying that I think we need to take into account the Darwinian principles of evolution in, in drug development, 
Um, Macroevolution is a very important aspect of, of, of cancer that, that drug development is largely ignoring, unfortunately, because it's difficult and complex. Um, we need to decipher mechanisms of, of, of diversity in genome instability in tumors, try to improve cancer selection pressures, and think about designing clinical trials in which we can do that. Exploit evolutionary rule books and epistatic events in tumors. And we hope that tumor heterogeneity itself will be an Achilles heel for tumor immunotherapy. And I haven't mentioned early detection at all before heterogeneity has taken place, but this is clearly a very important area. And last but not least, I need to thank the funders who made all this work possible, and everybody in red, particularly uh, in this slide, who've contributed to every slide that I've showed you today. Thank you very much for listening.